lactate is good for you and not bad, that it's not an evolutionary mistake that the body makes lactate, and in fact you want to give your patients lactate rather than take it away. And I need to thank my mentor there, Homer Simpson. So I have no disclosures, except my only disclosures, be cautious whatever I say. So we're going to talk about the myths, and there are lots of myths in medicine. One, this is one of the biggest myths. The first one is lactate causes an acidosis. As I'll show you, that's wrong. Increased lactate is due to anaerobic metabolism and decreased oxygen delivery. That's completely nonsense. Anaerobic production of lactate occurs during exercise. A defining feature of shock <coughs> is anaerobic metabolism. Ringer's lactate solution causes a lactic acidosis. Probably what's even more astounding is that the surviving sepsis campaign thinks that actually just measuring lactate, the act of actually measuring a lactate actually improves outcome. And probably the last myth is that the earth is round. There's the map and it's clearly flat. So yeasts actually can undergo anaerobic metabolism, but I don't see any yeast sitting here. Maybe Luciano is a yeast. So this whole business of lactate became popularized by Max Harry Weil, who showed this association between increasing lactate and decreased probability of survival and he assumed it was due to anaerobic metabolism. This was 40 years ago, and there's some people who still haven't evolved since then. And indeed, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign tells us we suggest targeting resuscitation to normalize lactate in patients with elevated lactate as a marker of tissue hyperperfusion. So the first thing is you cannot treat a lactate the same way as you cannot titrate therapy to a white cell count. How do you do such a thing? And secondly, it's not a marker of tissue hypoperfusion. So we need to look at the biochemistry. So you all know about glucose, it gets metabolized to pyruvate. And then two things can happen. It can go from pyruvate through pyruvate dehydrogenase into the Krebs cycle. And we'll talk about that because that's really important. If you can't get it into Krebs cycle for two reasons, one, you're making more than you can produce, or you have an abnormality of pyruvate dehydrogenase, which happens in sepsis, pyruvate will go to lactate. There are only two possibilities. The interesting thing is when you go from pyruvate to lactate, you actually consume a hydrogen ion. You consume a hydrogen ion. You cause an alkalosis. You do not cause an acidosis. And this was um, elegantly demonstrated in by a colleague of mine who I didn't know in South Africa, who basically he was a biochemist who showed the reaction producing lactate consumes a pair of free protons, thus retarding acidosis. It was more recently reviewed in American Journal of Physiology Lactate production retards. It does not cause an acidosis. The lactic acid explanation for metabolic acidosis is not supported by fundamental biochemistry and has no research basis of support. So the concept of lactic acidosis, unfortunately we teach it to every single medical student, is a condition that does not exist. We then need to talk about the tissue hypoxia myth. So it actually so happens that the mitochondrial PO2 that you need to sustain aerobic metabolism is exceedingly low. It's about one millimeter mercury. So there was this very interesting experiment where a bunch of silly people decided to climb, climb Mount Everest. Why you would do that, I don't know. And they did this without supplemental oxygen. So they climbed to the top of Mount Everest with no oxygen. Their PaO2, and then they actually stuck themselves with an artery, with a syringe in their femoral artery. They climb up there with no oxygen, they take a syringe, they punch themselves in their femoral artery, take out femoral blood. Their PO2 was 24, 24. 
And I think most of you would agree if your patients had a PO2 of 24, you would throw up your arms and say they're hypoxemic, yet their lactic acid was normal. It was normal. So this is another experiment where they took patients, humans actually, exercising. So these are athletes. They got them to exercise. Level one, level two, level three, increasing level of exercise. You can see at level two, they start producing lactate. They start exporting lactate. Their muscles export lactate. But if you look at their muscle PaO2, the mus intracellular muscle PO2, it actually goes up. It doesn't go down. So they start making lactate, although intracellular oxygen stays the same. And there is a brilliant reason why this happens. This is brilliant evolutionary design. And if you see what happens is that as, v, as, as exercise approaches Vmax, you reach about 60%, your epinephrine levels go up. Your epinephrine levels parallel, exactly parallel your increase in lactate. And you'll see why this is so cool. So what actually happens, this is a brilliant design. When you exercise, your muscles make lactate. They export lactate, not because anaerobically, but the lactate is used as a fuel for your heart and your brain. Because in terms of energy metabolism, your myocardial function functions much more efficiently when you use lactate rather than glucose as a source of energy. It's called the cell-to-cell -cell lactate shuttle. So we see this myocardial lactate metabolism during exercise. As you exercise, your heart starts consuming lactate as a source of energy. This is a brilliant design. You exercise, you increase lactate production, not anaerobically, but aerobically, which is then used by your heart and your brain. Your brain starts then utilizing lactate as a source of energy. So we often talk about VO2 and DO2. This was an experiment done in 1993, which is 25 years ago. So it is true indeed humans do become supply dependent, but you can see that the level has to be exceedingly low and this experiment has been repeated multiple times. So you actually become supply dependent at a hemoglobin of four or an cardiac index of one. So I think most would agree that's pretty bad. So unless your hemoglobin's above that or your cardiac index above one, you do not become supply dependent. And what they found 25 years ago Sepsis does not alter the critical delivery for anaerobic metabolism or tissue oxygen extraction. Interventions to increase oxygen delivery to supernormal levels or even normal levels in the hopes of increasing oxygen consumption may be inappropriate, i.e. may be a myth. So why do septic patients develop hyperlactemia? We know lactate goes up. This is simply because of beta-2 mediated adrenergic stimulation of intermediary metabolism, which results in increased breakdown of glycogen to glucose. You then make more pyruvate that can enter into Krebs cycle. As I said, it can't get in, so where does it go to lactate? This happens aerobically. What's even cooler and so increased lactate may simply occur because you're making more pyruvate than you can actually shuttle into the Krebs cycle. But there's another really cool piece to this. And that is, so this is, this is demonstrated in this little experiment where they gave asthmatics who were not acidotic, who had no lactate, beta-2 stimulants. And what they found that as they gave asthmatics beta-2 stimulants, their lactate went up and their lactate level was directly proportional to the serum albuterol. So beta-2 stimulation increases lactate production aerobically. Their pH stayed the same or went up. Again, proving making lactate doesn't cause an acidosis, and all you need to do to make lactate is stimulate your beta-2 receptors. So this is the other cool piece. So you need thiamine is a Thiamine pyrophosphate is a key enzyme for the Krebs cycle. It's required for pyruvate dehydrogenase to get pyruvate 
into the Krebs cycle. It just so happens two things. Firstly, that between 40 to 70 percent of patients with sepsis have subnormal or decreased levels of thiamine. So all you need to do is give them thiamine. Secondly, because of all these cytokines, you get some degree of the uh, the uh, down regulation of pyruvate dehydrogenase, the enzyme doesn't work so well. So if you fix the cytokines and you give thiamine, you can then restore energy metabolism. As Dr. Luciano has said multiple, multiple times, sepsis is a disease of energy failure. And how do you improve energy failure? By giving thiamine so you can utilize oxygen. It's such a simple thing to do. So this was one study which showed that giving thiamine to patients with sepsis causes lactate to go down and causes improves outcome. So lactate is good for you and not bad. It's not an evolutionary mistake that you make lactate. And indeed, as we said, brain and cardiac oxidation of lactate increased during exercise. If you remove lactate during stress, you cause cardiovascular collapse. I haven't shown you all the data, but you can take patients in shock and give them lactate, okay? We're not taking it away. We are giving them 23% lactate, improves cardiac function and improves outcome. Infusion of lactate has been shown to improve cognitive function and brain function in traumatic brain injury. Lactate is your friend and not your foe. So this is just one study, I'll read you the title, Myocardial Lactate Deprivation is Associated with Decreased Cardiovascular Performance, Decreased Myocardial Energetics, and Early Death in Endotoxic Shock. So once again, it's not a mistake, the body makes lactate, it is an essential fuel for the heart and the brain, and don't try and get it down. So the next myth is that lac la ringer's lactate causes an acidosis, which is obviously nonsense because you metabolize lactate, you actually consume hydrogen ions and causes an alchemia, either by gluconeogenesis and oxidation. Even in patients with liver failure, ringer's lactate follows these pathways, so it can never cause an acidosis. So we know this little silly story so what you have to do, you have to do this within three hours is measure lactate. If you don't, you go to lactate jail. It's somewhere in Guatemala, you know, uh, somewhere down south in Cuba, they put you in a jail if you don't measure lactate because measuring lactate in and of itself improves outcome. It's like saying, saying to a nephrologist, measure the creatinine, that's going to, it's going to treat uh, acute kidney injury. So what does the data show? So this study showed actually if you measure it within six hours, it makes absolutely no difference. This is a study which I recently reviewed, and they measured it within three hours. And they actually show that if you measure lactate in three hours, it was associated with improved outcome. But that was because people who measured lactate within three hours did other stuff as well. They gave antibiotics and they treated the patient. So it's an association. So patient, if you measure your lactate, it means you came to the ER, you did stuff to the patient, you gave them antibiotics, you examined them, you did other stuff, and you measured lactate. It's just an association, and to assume that actually doing a test improves outcome is absurd. So, I have one minute and one minute left. So just to summarize, in almost all situations, lactate is produced aerobically. So obviously there are exceptions. If you completely occlude an artery and make your, meat, your gut ischemic, you're going to produce, it, produce lactate anaerobically. If you thrombose a leg, you're going to produce it anaerobically. But in almost all other clinical situations, lactate is produced aerobically. It's a marker of stress. It's an evolutionary preserved response and is your friend, not your fro. Lactate retards rather than causes acidosis. Lactate is a major mitochondrial fuel. Re lactate is rapidly utilized in cell-to-cell -cell shuttles. Lactated ring and solution retards rather than causes an acidosis. And measuring a lactate cannot possibly in itself improve outcome.
Thank you.